All right, good morning. Really cool to have you all here. Happy Monday. Uh, first of all, I sure enjoyed the class presentations this last week. Wow. I All this weekend, I was bubbling, bab bab blah, 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 babbling to people about the different things I saw in class presentations. So thank you to all of you for your presentations. Very, very cool. John, I really got a kick out of that chair and the magnet that you showed. <laughs> wow, that is a powerful magnet. But anyway, you all had cool stories I could go on and on. But anyway, I guess I should stay focused somewhat. Um, this week in lab, Friday, if you have lab on Friday or Wednesday, uh, we'll look at problem set number four, which is over solubility. And there are some questions on entropy. It's how to calculate entropy and stuff like that. Pretty chill. The quiz will only be over solubility. All right, so only KSPs and jazz like that. And then we'll go next door and do the lab we were going to do a couple weeks ago, the acid and base titrations lab. So you'll actually do some of the titrations that we talked about. This is a little later than I intended, so I apologize for that, but eh, we'll make it work. Um, questions, any of that kind of stuff. We are going to talk about what I would argue is the most important law of all physical science. So not just chemistry, but physics and all the engineering and everything biological that revolves around energy. And it's the second law of thermodynamics. So there are three laws of thermodynamics. The first law, energy can't be created or destroyed. So all the energy that's known is around as is. You can reshuffle it, but you can't make or destroy anything. The third law we saw, I think it was on Friday, and that's where the only time you'll have a zero entropy is for a perfectly formed crystal of an element at zero Kelvin. And all three of those things are almost impossible to do, arguably. So it's very rare to have zero entropies. Almost always you'll have positive entropy values for individual elements and compounds. But the second law is really where science kicks in. And at first it doesn't look so impressive. It basically just says that anything, anytime you're gonna have a spontaneous, spontaneous in thermochemistry means it's going to happen naturally. You don't have to kick it or anything too hard. Uh, spontaneous means product favored. So equilibrium constants would be greater than one, stuff like that. Anytime you have a spontaneous reaction, all right, the delta S for the universe is positive. And the delta S of the universe incorporates the delta S of the system, so what you're looking at, plus the delta S of the surroundings, i.e. everything around the system, all right? And that's actually pretty sweeping, as we'll see, for different things. So anything you do, anything we do in lab, anything you see happen, delta S of the universe is gonna be positive. So again, the other day, I threw papers on the ground, they fell on the ground and made a mess. Positive delta S, all right? But then I reshuffled the papers, tried to put them back together in about the same way. Well, that happened, but because that happened, it also has to have a delta S of the universe, which is greater than zero. So the system and the surroundings are kind of important to figure out, and scientists have done a really good job figuring them out. The delta S of the system is basically where the matter dispersal comes from. So when I threw the papers on the ground, I really didn't do anything with energy, I just let them fall, and they kind of went crazy. Nice word, but anyway, that was matter dispersal. They went all over the floor. Then, later on, I took some energy and I put them all back together and stuff like that. Well, I had to take energy to make that happen. So that's more of the energy dispersal part. We saw earlier that when you, people looked at all reactions ever studied, uh, they either had matter dispersal, energy dispersal, or both, all right? And so if you think about both of those uh, in this kind of way, you can figure out what's going on. So this little silly video maybe says the second law of thermodynamics better than I could. This was dead for years. I don't know why. Oh, yes, I do. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Sooner or later, everything turns to shit. That's my phrasing, not the second law of thermodynamics. This is from Husbands and Wives, the Woody Allen movie, and it just cracks me up because the second law in thermodynamics arguably does say that after a while, everything turns to S. I apologize for the non-G-rated word, by the way. But anyway, that's kind of what this is all about. If you have matter dispersal, you went from organized to disorganized, all right? 
if you have energy dispersal, you went from concentrated energy to dispersed energy. So both of those are kind of like the world is going to S. <laughs> and not entropy S, by the way. Anyway, you don't have to like Woody Allen or anything like that to appreciate that. But that's kind of what the second law of thermodynamics is all about. So again, I want to repeat this because this is really important. Anything that happens, anything you see happen, anything that you do naturally, is going to have an entropy of the universe greater than zero. Questions on? Okay. When we dissolve ammonium nitrate in water, the dissolution is an endothermic process. The temperature of the solution decreases over the course of the reaction. The reaction, though not favored energetically, is favored by entropy. It is said to be entropy driven. As the ammonium nitrate dissolves, the entropy of the system increases. At the same time, the surroundings lose energy and experience a decrease in entropy. The increase in system entropy, however, is greater than the decrease in the surroundings entropy. Thus, the total entropy the sum of the entropy changes in the system and surroundings increases as demanded by the second law of thermodynamics. In Chem 221 and Chem 222, reactions that were exothermic were the ones that we said were product favored. And that's usually, as we'll see, a pretty good example. So in that, in those kind of cases, the end, the temperature of your surroundings, which is what you're measuring, would increase, all right? If it's exothermic energy is released, the temperature of your system will go up. But this is an example of ammonium nitrate dissolving in water. Whoopie doo! All right, a solid dissolves in water. Woohoo! But why it's cool for right now, all right, is that this is an example of an endothermic reaction. So the temperature of the solution went down, and that means the outside energy is going to the inside. So let's justify this now as to what's going on to make the delta S of the universe greater than zero, all right? And what we're seeing here is that the surroundings, which is related to temperature, the surroundings delta S is not greater than zero. All right, energy is being pulled from the outside in. You're having energy being more concentrated if you have an endothermic reaction. That's what it kind of means. So it goes from the outside to the inside in an endothermic. So if this one is not positive, that has to make this one positive. And if you think about it a little bit, that kind of sounds right because this concentrated solid goes into first of all a dissolved version but then that further goes on into ammonium and nitrate ions so you get two ions per sodium per ammonium nitrate solid and all of those kind of things make a lot of matter dispersal so we see something happens the ammonium nitrate dissolve so that means that delta s of the universe will be greater than zero all right, anything you see happen, delta S of the universe will be greater than zero. However, endothermic means that the surroundings, the energy is becoming more concentrated. It's going from the outside to the inside, not less concentrated, which would be the inside to the outside in exothermic. So if this one is negative, then this one has to be positive. And you can totally find that out because solids, one solid going to two ions in a solution, ion dipole formed, all those kind of things happening. Yeah, that's going to have a lot of disorganization on the matter level. The matter is becoming uh, less less concentrated. It goes from a very concentrated solid to very dispersed ions running around. Any questions on that? Okay. Are you sure about that, Dr. Russell? Good question. You can actually calculate the entropy of these different processes. So let's do an example for making liquid water. And we talked about this briefly the other day, but I want to go back and figure it out. So if we wanted to calculate the delta S of the universe for making liquid water from elemental hydrogen and oxygen, uh, here's what we would do. So first of all, we'd have to find the delta S of the system. And the other day we did this by taking the delta S of the products minus the delta S of the reactants. And we looked up the value for liquid water in the table at the end of problem set five. 
multiplied it by two. We subtracted two times hydrogen and an oxygen. We talked about how the delta S for this system is negative because you're going from three moles to two moles and a bunch of gases to liquids. So entropy likes more moles being made, that's more disorder. It also prefers gases over liquids and liquids over uh, solids. So going from gases to liquids is not entropy favorite either. So this is a negative entropy here. Uh, entropy really doesn't like this reaction to occur. Now, you can find the delta S of the surroundings using enthalpy. And I'm gonna kind of throw this out of the hat, but the Q of the surroundings, which is what we need for the delta S of the surroundings, is related to negative delta H of the system. If the system is negative, to, uh, or excuse me, negative, its energy is released, then the surroundings will be positive. They have the opposite sign. And why we're doing this is because we can calculate delta H in the same way we did for delta S. We would take the delta H of the products minus the delta H of the reactants, like this kind of thing right here. These values are in the table in problem set five. So hopefully you can see here, we're gonna start using this table at the end of problem set five here, quite a bit coming out. Um, anyway, you do all this action, the delta H comes out to be a negative number. Exothermic, all right, so energy is being released. If you take this negative number and make it positive, so negative times negative is a positive, and you divide by the temperature in which you have, which is 298, that little superscript zero there means standard conditions, if you remember all that. Anyway, you get the delta S of the surroundings, a positive 1917.5 joules per Kelvin. So, a lot of pieces on this slide. Any questions where any of this stuff came from? Okay. Um, the delta S of the system was negative. Three moles to two moles, gases to liquids. None of that's happy. But on the other hand, the delta S of the surroundings is very, very positive. Exothermic reactions like this one create very positive delta S of the surrounding values. So while the system itself says, boy, this is lame, gases to liquids, blah, 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 the surroundings is actually pretty happy because all that energy that was pent up in the hydrogen and oxygen is released upon making water, and you get a very positive delta S value. Okay, well now that you've got the system delta S and the surroundings delta S, you can add those two together and calculate the delta S of the universe. So earlier on, here's the system and the surroundings. This one was delta S products minus delta S reactants. This one in a nutshell was delta H minus delta H over the temperature. To get that number, add them together, positive 1590.6 joules per Kelvin. And again, if this number is positive, that means this reaction's gonna go. And hydrogen and oxygen absolutely want to make water. This is what got the space shuttle in orbit and stuff like that. A lot of energy is created by the formation of water. And this is a thermodynamic way of justifying how exothermic and how product favored this reaction actually is. A balloon filled with hydrogen and surrounded by air represents a potential chemical reaction. To initiate the reaction, we need to ignite the balloon. The hydrogen will combine with oxygen in the air to form water in gaseous form, releasing considerable energy in the process. At the molecular scale, the molecules of gaseous hydrogen, H2, and oxygen, O2, combine to produce H2O, water, generating heat and light. In the combustion of hydrogen and oxygen, the entropy of the atoms in the sample, or system, decreases. This decrease occurs in concert with the transfer of thermal energy to the surroundings, leading to an increase in the entropy of the surroundings. The entropy increase for the surroundings is greater than the decrease for the sample, so the net change in entropy is upward. 
So for any reaction you've ever seen, ever read about, any of the things we talked about in class presentations last week, all of those reactions that happen naturally, delta S of the universe is greater than zero. And this is kind of the ultimate way to figure it out. Uh, you can see here how the system really didn't want this reaction to go, but the surroundings was so much more positive than the system that it overpowered the system. So in this case, the surroundings was a bigger value, if you will, than the system. And that's why the delta S of the universe says, go for it, make this happen. Positive delta S of the universe, reaction's gonna happen. Negative delta S of the universe, reaction won't happen. Questions? Okay, so let's think about these reactions and think about which one would have the largest positive entropy change, all right? Now, there's a couple ways to do these kind of reactions, all right? but. The way that I, you could go delta S of the products minus delta S of the reactants, and if you had a table, that would be fantastic. On the other hand, maybe you don't have a table, like right now, you can oftentimes kind of think about it and figure out which one will have the biggest entropy change. So here's the thinking. Uh, on this reaction right here, we have two moles of gas going to two moles of gas, all right? and that's probably not going to be a very big positive entropy change. Maybe it's even a little bit negative. It's hard to say. But we wouldn't expect there to be a huge entropy change here that would be positive because two moles are going to two moles and two gases are going to two gases. And both of those aren't very fun for entropy. Now here's one, a gas going to a liquid. What do you think the sign of entropy will be for that one? Well, does entropy like gases more or liquids more? Liquids. Cool. Uh, solids have the smallest entropy. Then as they go into liquids, there's more flexibility. So liquids have more than solids. And liquids, though, do have some control over them. So gases are actually the highest of all the entropy things. So in this problem, we have a really high entropy going to like a medium entropy level. So this one we would think would actually have a negative entropy, if anything, and stuff. So that one might be pretty tough. If you skip down to the last one, this one goes along with it. Liquids, like we said, are kind of the medium entropy and solids are the smallest entropy. So this one we probably wouldn't predict would have very, probably more would be negative than anything possible. So that kind of leaves this one right here. What kind of chemical reaction is this? What have we been calling these kind of reactions? Precipitate. Um, precipitates would have a solid. Um, so there's no solids there. Otherwise, that would be very valid. The types of vaporization. That's that's that counts. Yeah. C combustion ah. is what I was looking for. Burn, burn things. Burn. <laughs> I was like, I watched too much pizza about it at one time. But anyway, yeah, combustion reactions are when you burn things. And burning, you have to have some oxygen. The spark is given. You end up with CO2 and water when you're burning something organic. So this is a combustion reaction. Now, look at all the moles of gas that you've got. All right, and that's pretty cool. Now, 15 over 2 is uh, 7 and a half. All right, so we do have seven and a half moles of gas initially, but we have nine moles of gas at the end. So we have more gas moles than we started with. That's a good sign. Also, there's a total of eight and a half moles, if you count this mole of liquid, versus eight and a half versus nine. That's also an increase of entropy. The more moles you can get out, the more entropy. Um, so we should argue here that C is probably going to be the best call. More moles of product than moles of reactant. So seven and a half plus one would be eight and a half compared to nine. More moles of product, definitely. Also, all of our products are gases. And gases are the highest entropy. Gases higher than liquids, liquids higher than solids. Any questions?
cool. Okay, <clears throat> so when chemists want to know if a reaction is spontaneous or not, all right, the delta S of the universe must be greater than zero. And this little chart shows the four combinations of enthalpy and entropy that will or will not create delta S of the universe is greater than zero. Anytime you have an exothermic reaction, delta H is gonna be negative, and a delta S of the system which is greater than zero, you will always have delta S of the universe greater than zero. So these two are gonna happen all the time. Conversely, endothermic and delta S values less than zero will always be non-spontaneous. All right, well, they'll never happen, arguably. Now, what we saw a little bit ago, we saw an exothermic reaction, so delta H was less than zero, and we saw that the entropy of the system making water was actually a number less than zero. We had more order and not less order. This is one of the times when it depends on the temperature, and this is another common thing. You could actually figure out some temperatures where that reaction wouldn't have a delta S of the universe greater than zero. And you can do the same thing when you have an endothermic and a delta S value greater than zero. Um, we're gonna look at the chemist's version of delta S of the universe here coming up, but uh, chemist's version is related to delta G of the, uh, de de thanks for playing, delta G is the chemist's version of delta S universe, by the way. But anyway, delta, uh, delta G, which is the chemist version, is related to delta S of the universe. And for chemists, it makes more sense for whatever reason. But if you wanna break it down to the basics, this is what it's all about right here. And all reactions that are known, you could be on Mars, Alpha Centauri, radio telescope places, wherever. You can be anywhere and stuff, and these laws should apply. So if you wanna know if a reaction's gonna go, and you have an exothermic and entropy disordered reaction, you bet that's gonna go. On the other hand, some of the reactions won't go under any circumstances too, so it's kinda of crazy. Questions? So knowing if a reaction will happen or not is pretty important. apologize for that video. That was a promo from a European agency that was trying to get people to come to their program, but it just cracks me up on one level. But anyway, uh, knowing about when elements will happen or not, of course, is important, but uh, all right, my apologies. Let's talk about uh, what chemists' version of delta S of the universe is called. Um, Gibbs realized that the delta S of the universe equation is totally cool, all right? Delta S surroundings plus delta S the system, blah, blah, blah. But we've done so much already with delta H, all right? And Gibbs realized, wow, there's gotta be a better way to incorporate delta H directly into figuring out if a reaction will occur or not. So uh, delta S of the universe we saw was minus delta H over T. And this delta H is what we've been using since Chem 221. This is delta H products minus delta H reactants. It's the Hess's law. It's the bonds broken minus bonds formed. All this stuff we've gone through, all right? 
Well, Gibbs saw this equation, which was pretty ugly, and he decided to multiply it through by minus temperature. And if you do that, the minus there and the T disappears, but then you end up with minus T delta S. And then on the other side, of course, you've got minus T delta S of the universe. Well, long story short, he decided that minus T times delta S should be its own thermodynamic quantity, which is cool. And eventually, they ended up calling it the delta G of the system. And delta G is what they call Gibbs free energy. So delta G is related to the delta S of the universe, all right? Minus T times the delta S of the universe equals delta G. And chemists ran with this because it's a direct relationship that way between our beloved enthalpy and the delta S of the system. So this equation is probably the chemist's version of the second law of thermodynamics, all right? There's nothing wrong with using delta S universe equals surroundings plus system. But most of the time, this is what chemists will use. And they use it because it's got enthalpy in it directly. And this delta S is just delta S products minus delta S reactants. So we're going to use Gibbs free energy a lot. It's a third type of, of thermodynamic thing. And in that table at the end of problem set five, you've got, I believe, enthalpy first, delta H, because that's the most important. Entropy, I believe, is the second column. And the third column are values of these delta H's. Delta G's, sorry. <laughs> delta G. So it goes delta H, delta S, delta G. Question. Okay, because delta G equals minus T delta S, well, if delta S the universe has to increase in order to make something happen, if you take that positive and you multiply it by a negative, that means your delta G's are gonna be negative. So in chemistry, we're gonna look for negative delta G's to reflect if a reaction will occur or not. The Gibbs free energy is just the total energy change of the system, which minus the energy lost in disorder. So this is the energy of the system. That's what enthalpy has been about this whole time. And minus the temperature times the entropy of the disorder. All right, how much disorder there is versus how much enthalpy there is. So just like before, you can have conditions where you'll always have good values of delta G and always values of bad delta G. If you have an exothermic reaction that has negative delta H, so you'll have a negative number for this part, and you have a positive delta S, which is an increase in entropy, well, positive delta S times negative T makes this whole part negative. So you've got a negative there, a negative there, that's gonna mean your delta G is negative. And a negative delta G is equivalent to the positive delta S of the universe. Negative delta G, those reactions will occur. Those are the spontaneous ones. So earlier I said anything that happens is gonna have an increase in the entropy of the universe. Also, anything that happens is gonna have a negative delta G. Same effect just a different sign because of the way that the equation's been manipulated. And again, chemists think in terms of delta G a lot more than delta S of the universe. So I'll be talking about looking for negative delta Gs. That just means the reaction's gonna go. Okay. So negative delta H's, exothermic, and increases in entropy, positive delta S's, will always give negative delta G's. And that, those are the spontaneous ones, the ones that are gonna happen. Questions on that? Okay. The opposite can, we should talk about too. Endothermic reactions, energy where the system takes the energy in, positive delta H's. And if you have a decrease in entropy, where they have less moles at the end or more uh, liquids versus gases, stuff like that, that's gonna have a negative delta S. Negative times negative makes that whole thing positive. So if you have an endothermic and a decrease in entropy, your delta G will always be positive. So positive delta Gs are the reactions that won't go. On the other hand, negative delta Gs are the ones that are going to happen. And again, this is going to be important for us. We're going to start thinking about if a reaction occurs or doesn't occur.
all right? If a reaction occurs, it's going to have a negative delta G. But if the reaction has endothermic and decreasing in entropy, you're always going to get a positive delta G's. Positive delta G's mean the reaction won't go. All right, let's look at an example. All right, so here's an example. Magnesium is reacting with oxygen gas to make magnesium oxide. We have a delta H, which is negative. We have a delta S, which is negative as well. This means it's very exothermic. Lots and lots of energy given off if we have a negative delta H. On the other hand, a negative delta S means that you have less disorder. And if you think about this reaction, you've got one mole of magnesium and half a mole of oxygen, so one and a half moles going to one mole. That's one way to understand why this entropy is not happy, all right? Entropy wants more disorder, more gases, all right? More moles, and we certainly have less moles going from, from reactants to products. And we also have half of a gas being absorbed into a solid. Entropy's like, this is lame, <laughs> all right? So this negative number is entropy saying it's lame. Anyway, so to figure out the delta G, what you can do in your calculator is you take the delta H minus T delta S. So at 25 degrees Celsius, if you add 273.15 to it, it makes 298. And that times delta S will give you the number. But one thing I want to point out here big time is that delta H is almost always in kilojoules and delta S almost always in joules. So you've got to convert one over to the other. All of these answers are in kilojoules. So in this problem, I would definitely convert my entropy in joules into kilojoules. How many joules in a kilojoule? Thousand. Thousand, right on. Mathematically, if you move the decimal over to the left three places, that's what you're going to do. So this would be minus 0.10836 kilojoules per Kelvin. You would multiply this by the answer and figure it out. Now, most of the time, enthalpy rules the day, all right? And that's why in Chem 221, Chem 222, if we saw a negative uh, value, we just assumed that it was going to go. This way, we can actually figure out that it's going to go, all right? Not just take our Chem 221 through Chem 222 assumption. You can actually calculate that your delta G is a negative number. Negative delta Gs are the ones that are going to happen, all right? Positive delta Gs would mean those reactions don't happen. Uh, any questions on any of this stuff? All right. One thing to see here too, uh, when it comes down to deciding if a reaction is going to occur or not occur, there's kind of like two pieces to consider and you're seeing them here in their great detail. Enthalpy and entropy, all right? Now here, enthalpy is negative and a negative delta H will contribute to a negative delta G. So enthalpy wants this reaction to occur. But enthal entropy, excuse me, entropy if it's positive, will contribute to a negative delta G because delta S times negative T makes that whole part negative. So in this case, a negative delta S times a negative T will make that whole part positive. Entropy doesn't want this to occur. So you've got enthalpy, which says, I want this to occur. Entropy says, I don't want this to occur. And this was my idea behind babbling the other day about the double-headed snake. Because those enthalpy and entropies are kind of like snakes, all right? And they fight. Now, in this case, the negative delta G means that enthalpy mm, wiped entropy out. Juvenile, less sound effects, I know. But anyway, yeah, literally enthalpy defeated entropy. Kind of a weird way to think about it. Uh, that's what the negative number means. This reaction is going to go because enthalpy here is stronger than entropy. So when I babble once in a while about double-headed snakes, it's enthalpy versus entropy. And sometimes both sides want the reaction to occur. Sometimes both sides don't want the reaction to occur. And here we're seeing a fight, all right? Enthalpy wants it to occur. Entropy doesn't want it to occur. But enthalpy made it happen, made the delta G name. 
Any questions? There are four combinations of enthalpy and entropy, and they will affect the sine of delta G. And the big two are right here, all right? If you have an exothermic delta H, that means you've got a negative delta H. If entropy is increasing, that means this is positive, but a positive times a negative makes this whole part negative. So negative here and a negative delta H means delta G will always be negative and those are product favor. All the time, all temperatures, good to go. On the other hand, Kayla and I are investigating a new procedure for making napkins, I don't know. And we figure out, this is a weird example, Kayla, so sorry, but anyway, we figure out that making the reaction is endothermic, all right, it's gonna take energy, it's got a positive delta H, and also because we're basically making something more ordered from a bunch of random things, there's a decrease in entropy. So this is an example where enthalpy says, well, I don't really want it to go because it's endothermic, it's a positive number. Entropy says, I don't want it to go because you're making things more organized from where they were before. It's a negative. And negative times negative makes this whole part positive. This delta G, positive all the time. And that's a big thumbs down from Gibbs free energy. That reaction wouldn't go. So Kayla and I initially would be stymied by the science here. If you have a positive delta G, that's going to be a hard barrier to overcome. Now, we're gonna talk in the next chapter about some ways to cheat thermodynamics. You're not really cheating, but it feels like cheating, so I'm gonna call it cheating. It's not really cheating, though. But anyway, there are ways to kind of get around these rules sometimes, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter. But for right now, just realize, if you've got a positive delta H and a negative delta S, those reactions aren't gonna go. There's gonna to have to be some kind of other process involved to figure out how you can make those things. However, Kaylin, because I picked on her, and I are doing a process for making fill in the blank, and we find a negative delta H that makes the reaction want to go. Negative always makes the reaction want to go for delta H. But on the other hand, our delta S is a negative number as well, so it's less disordered all right, than it was. Well, this is an example where the two sides of the snake fight. All right, if enthalpy wants the reaction to go, entropy does not want the reaction to go. So Kaylin and I can make this work, but there is gonna be a temperature dependence. Temperature times delta S eventually will overpower delta H. So we're gonna see that if temperature is higher, higher temperatures, and higher is very relative, uh, this reaction actually won't occur. But at quote unquote lower temperatures, and again, low is very relative, Kaylin and I can make this have a negative delta G, as long as the entropy term doesn't overpower the enthalpy. Finally, Clifford and I are making something else. I'm feeling so productive today. Anyway, Clifford and I find that the delta H is positive, delta S is positive. Well, delta S positive makes the reaction wanna go. So we're like, yeah, cool, but, ah. Oh endothermic. Endothermic says, no, not going to happen. Well, Clifford and I can make this reaction happen too, but again, we have to make the minus T delta S part overpower delta H. So at higher temperatures, and this is very relative by the way, but at higher temperatures, the delta S term begins to overpower the delta H. And if you do that, then you get that delta G, which is negative, which means the reaction is going to go. So you can see how this is important to chemists, all right? You're making something, maybe everything's perfect, good to go, all temperatures, rock star. On the other hand, these two are very common, all right? And you have to play with the temperature a little bit to make the reaction actually work for you. We're making cheese. <laughs> cheese in <laughs> temperature. <laughs> cheese. Absolutely right. <laughs> making the cheese, man. Right? Bringing it back home, I like it. So. <laughs> Cheeses have certain temperatures. There. Well, anyway, I, yeah. <laughs> we don't need to discuss dairy things or not dairy things for that matter. Two minutes. Anyway, prop that back on. Other questions besides cheese, unless you're Clifford. All right. So here's a reaction, a uh, possible thing you might have. You've got a reaction, negative enthalpy, negative delta H. Let's stop right there. 
does the negative delta H make delta G uh, happy or make it want to go, or does it hurt delta G? Happy. Yeah, happy. Negative delta H means delta G is going to be negative, and that's good in this context. I know it's weird, but a negative delta H means that, yeah, this reaction wants to go. Enthalpy is on your side. But it also has a negative entropy, all right? Now, negative delta S times negative T makes this whole part positive, and that doesn't make your chances of this reaction happening very good. So in this question, then, it says, uh, what can be said about this reaction? And there's four different possibilities. This is, again, a bad reference to a movie. Anyway, so in this case, we don't want the entropy term to get too big, all right? We want to keep the delta H term big and negative so that delta G is negative. So in this question, like we were talking about earlier, lower temperatures will make T delta S small relative to delta H. So lower temperatures will make this reaction spontaneous. Delta H will overpower this term. Low is very relative. It could be, you know, 100 Celsius. It could be, you know, 10,000 Celsius. It's hard to say those kind of things without having the numbers in front of you. But lower temperatures will be good, and higher temperatures, quote unquote, will make this part overpower this part, and that will make it non-spontaneous. So temperature-wise, like, it would be relatively higher though, depending on what you're working with. Like I know gold has like a very high melting temperature, like in that regard, would be considered higher low. Exactly. So uh, that's a good question. Um, so delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Uh, let's pretend here that delta H is 100, and we'll say all the units are the same. Minus T and delta S we'll say is 10, all right? Well, in this case, uh, you can see that 100 is bigger than 10 if T is small. So if T was, say, 1 Kelvin, which this is a little silly of an example, so I'm sorry, but then 100, uh, this would be negative, by the way, this would be negative. So minus 100 uh, would be this kind of case, and the delta S is negative. Minus 100 plus 10, you'd get minus 90 for delta G. And if delta G is negative, then that would mean that reaction would occur. But as you can see, Stephanie, if you go to like 100 here, uh, then you'd have plus 1,000, and you'd end up with positive uh, 900. And that would give you a delta G, which was positive and wouldn't occur. So it totally depends on the numbers for delta H and delta S. The lower temperatures will favor the negative delta H, but the higher temperatures, like this one, then would favor the, the negative delta S. Excellent. The math is not hard at all, but it is a little like funky at first. So, so it's the, ambiguous. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You have to kind of like think about it, and it's two terms you're essentially adding together. You're not multiplying, which is also weird too. So, cool. Excellent questions. Other questions? Okay. So. There are two methods that are used often to calculate delta G. We'll look at some other ones here too, but the two main ones, the first one is this one right here, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So you calculate delta H, usually delta H products minus delta H reactants. You calculate delta S, delta S products minus delta S reactants. Plug them in at the temperature you're studying to calculate delta G. All right, and that's by far the most common one. This, that's the Gibbs equation, they call it. However, if you have a table, like at the end of problem set five, and you have all the values for your reactants and products, you can also go delta G products minus delta G reactants, just like I said you could do for delta H and delta S. So if you have all the values for delta G, this is a lot less work, all right? You don't have to memorize any of the delta G values. You just look them up on a table. Um, both of these are used a lot. Yeah, this one's probably the biggest one, all right? Delta H minus T delta S. But if you have all the delta Gs at the temperature you're looking at, good to go. That is the Gibbs deep dish cheese. <laughs> I like your references to cheese, man. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that would be the cheese dish, the ultimate cheese dish. This is thin crust, doable, you know, this is the deep, I don't know. 
Anyway, go put in your own things. Just say no. Yeah. Questions besides? Good. Uh, here's a sample of the like part of the table that you have at the end of problem set five, and here's all the different delta G values. Um, most of the delta G values are negative, all right? And what that means is that, for example, this is rust, iron three oxide. Iron three oxide really wants to form. It's very negative delta G, all right? It wants to happen. But some of them are positive. So for example, diamond doesn't usually happen by itself. You have to add some energy to it. So it's a positive delta G. Also, just like the delta H values we've seen since Chem 221, the pure elements have delta G values equal to zero as well. Um, we saw this with enthalpy as well. The elements in their pure states like these have values, delta H values equal to zero. But when you get to a weird state like diamond, then you have to look the number up. And delta G is the same way. So one thing that will help you if you do delta G products minus delta G reactants, all the elements, just zero, just like delta H. Now remember for entropy, entropy products minus entropy reactants, you should never have zeros. They're always gonna be positive numbers. The only time the entropy is zero are those crazy perfect crystals at zero Kelvin, which is like never. So you have to look up the values of entropy all the time for all species. But for delta G and delta H, the elements are zero, which is kind of cool. So <clears throat> here's an example. Uh, delta G, we want to find the delta G for this reaction, which is making carbon dioxide from diamond, <laughs> all right? Uh, diamond is, of course, a form of carbon, and you can make carbon dioxide from it. Well, here's the values of CO2. This is the value of diamond. Oh, I didn't give you the value delta G for oxygen. What's the value delta G for elements in their standard states? Zero, that's right. Oxygen's natural state is a gas, so it's gonna have a value of zero here. So to calculate the delta G, excuse me, delta G of products minus delta G reactants, that means delta G of CO2, our one product, minus the delta G of diamond and the delta G of O2. Delta G of O2 you can ignore, it's an element in its standard states, so it's basically this minus the diamond value. And if you do that, you get a negative 397.3 kilojoules per mole value. Questions on the map? So, if any of you have a diamond on your ring, earring, I don't have any diamonds, but anyway, if you do have one, does this number say that your diamonds are gonna go to CO2? What do you say? You want to say no. <laughs> I understand. Because if, if they went to CO2 like pretty readily, the diamonds wouldn't stay very long. Emotionally, right there with you. But let's have our let's have our science hats on here. Negative delta G's are those the reactions that occur or don't occur? They're going. They're going. <laughs> so Stephanie, I'm right there with you, right? You don't want your diamonds to break down. But this number right there says it's happening. <laughs> now, Stephanie and all the rest of you, don't go selling your diamonds at the hawk shop or anything like that right after class because, oh, 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 kinetics is the savior. Kinetics is how fast reactions go. And the diamond to graphite reaction is like glacially slow. It's incredibly slow. So it, they, it takes lifetimes for the CO2 to form from your diamonds and from graphite as well, all right? Uh, under normal circumstances, diamond, definitely, and graphite as well, don't turn to CO2. So these numbers say that, you know, one day, millennia away, yeah, your diamonds are going to all go to CO2 and be worthless, but your children's children's children will still be able to appreciate your diamonds if you decide to pass it down. Unless you throw it in a catalyst, but that's <laughs> a catalyst would be a really cool use of your diamonds, in my science opinion, but <laughs> anyway, probably not very useful, yeah, so. So, woohoo, kinetics, saving the day. <laughs> Any questions on that? All right, that's probably a good place to stop. We'll look at some more Delta G applications on Wednesday. Have a great day.